Welcome back. Well, I'm out here in a beautiful day in the shade here. It's, it's this is absolutely perfect weather. It's so nice. It's got to be. I don't know what the actual temperature is right now, but it, it's absolutely perfect. It's got to be about 78 degrees or something, but as dry as a bone. Uh, out in the out in the sun in the sunshine there, it's just nice to to putter around. Uh, it doesn't get any better than this. So so here's Benny. Benny, you want to come and see him? <laughs> he's 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 taking his nap. Uh, he'll be up and about in a minute, I'm sure. Can you see him down there? Huh? <laughs> uh, he just he just loves. He's 11 years old now. It's been uh, four years since he had his uh, cancer miracle, his survival miracle, and uh, that everybody, every, all my, all my fans out there were uh, praying for him, and uh, stormed heaven. So they heard God heard him, and uh, here he is still, four years later. He was supposed to, he was supposed to uh, kick the bucket back then. So I've had a bunch of. Um, I've had a bunch of requests through the years for uh, a discussion on the 2506 Remington. I've neglected, I suppose, to uh, address the uh, 2506 pine cones here off this pine tree. Um, I've neglected to uh, talk about the 2506, so I'm going to talk about it now. No particular reason that I neglected it. Um, I simply didn't have a rifle to show you. I couldn't do a show and tell, really. And um, there's been other there's been other cartridges that I wanted to talk about, but um, for good reason. I'll talk about it now. Uh, I I have a I have kind of a, a personal story to tell about the 2506. It was around the mid mid 70s. Um, a friend of mine, a coworker. He was oh he was he was carrying on about the 2506. Uh, he said it was the greatest greatest cartridge he ever shot. It was fantastic. He he said he was talking about on uh, long range you know woodchuck shots you know 300 400 yards and he says it devastating you know with uh, uh, lightweight bullets you know with 87 grain bullets and I don't know if I don't know if there were any. I don't know if uh, anybody made any 70, uh, 75 grain bullets like the like the Hornady back in those days, but uh, and 60 grain bullets, you know, is, uh, simply uh, they're they're somewhat flat nose and they're be more of a lever action cartridge bullet for the uh, 25, 35 and the 256 uh, Winchester. So they really weren't, you know, unless unless you're just looking to plink. But he was uh, he was really talking up a storm about this 2506 of his. So one day I showed up at his house and I, I had my I had my my 222 uh, with me and I said let's go let's go woodchuck shooting. I said get your 2506. Well, he said I don't have a 2506. I said well you were ta talking about the 2506 like it was uh, you know with all kinds of uh, endearment. He said well he said I sold it way back. He says I haven't had it now for about six or eight years. I said, well, thanks a lot. So uh, we went, went back to my house and I grabbed my my uh, other rifle, my 22 250, and we so we went out with both of those rifles, the 222 and the 22 250, and uh, went woodchuck hunting, and we had a, we had a blast. But you know, he, he talked up a storm about this. 2506 to such a degree that I said, "Gee, that maybe that maybe that's a rifle I have to have someday." Well, as things are, you know, you really can't talk yourself into something you really don't need. You know, paying a couple of hundred dollars back in those days of brand new rifles, 200 and 225 dollars or so, and I really couldn't justify that sort of thing when I had two perfectly good environment rifles, and uh, I didn't need to have an additional. Uh, deer, deer rifle. I already had. I already had my 306, and uh, but it laid in the back of my mind until uh, one day, two or three years later. Uh, my my dear friend, my late friend, that uh, <laughs> was a uh, he was my range partner uh, for a number of years. He was older than me, um, and uh, but he was a he was a superb shooter. And uh, outdoorsman, and um, 
he was complaining one day about his uh, 742 uh, 306, just not his uh, Remington uh, automatic, just not shooting at all. He said the thing was very inaccurate and, uh, you know, pie plate accuracy, jammed on occasion, you know, unreliable. So for all those reasons, he, he, he said, you know, he said, I think I'm going to get, I think I get a different gun. Well, you know, that light bulb came on, and uh, I said, "Gee, you know, why don't you why don't you get a 2506?" And uh, I said, "You need to have a you need to have a good uh, deer rifle, and, and you should have a good varmint round too. You know, and that would that'd be a, a double double whammy. You'd have both." And he says, "Yeah." He says, "I he he was totally opposed to the idea of a 25 caliber bullet going after deer because he was a 30 caliber guy. You know, he was a 306 guy." So anyway, we went up to Riley's Sports Shop and um, walked in, and uh, it was it was about it was about two months before deer season opened. There's Benny. Here he is. He wanted to say hi. So you can see he's getting he's getting a little bit he's getting a little bit white around the eyebrows and around his muzzle, uh, but he earned it. He's uh, he's a respectable senior citizen age. So, but he still gets around pretty good. He still can he still can jump this high up onto our high bed, and uh, with one leap, and um, he can clear uh, he can clear a fence post if he if he wants to. We have to be careful of that. He's still he's still quite athletic and and spry. He's uh, he, he's not overweight in the least, and um, he escaped the knife. So he's uh, he's still he's he's still a very he's still a very much an intact male. Uh, but he, he's, he's a virgin. He's never had any, he's, ne he's never had any encounters of that sort. But, um, so where was I? Uh, we walked into the, we walked into the store and, uh, searched the racks. He wasn't in the, he wasn't in the market for a new gun. He just didn't want to spend money for a new gun. But he, he had a couple of, um, he had a couple of rifles to trade in. He had a, uh, 6.5, uh, Carcano uh, to uh, trade in, and uh, his 742 and his dad's old um, World War II uh, Civil Defense issue shotgun with his pla double barrel shotgun with a plastic stock. It was it was an awful looking thing. Was, I'm sure I'm sure it's probably a collector's item now, but he wanted to get rid of that. So we had those three guns, and uh, he had a few bucks in his pocket in case he had to add to the mix. Well, it didn't take us long to find out that there were no 30, 30.06s in the rack. They were all gone. And uh, he certainly wasn't interested in, uh, in anything, anything with a weird name. And, but, I, but I said, gee, you know, the, I, saw, I saw this 25.06, this Ruger Model 77 sitting in the rack and had a uh, heavy sporter barrel uh, with the uh, barrel band front sight on it. So, you know, I did my very best to talk. I said, you know, you really, that's, that's the rifle for you. I said, you'll have, you'll have both guns right there. And uh, I said, I'm sure, I'm sure it'd be a great deer rifle. And I really was lying because I didn't know if it was gonna be a great deer rifle or not. I had, I had my, I had my second thoughts about, you know, I still wasn't sold on the idea of a 270 in those days because uh, I thought a 270 would be, and rightly so, I thought it'd be overly destructive in the woods. But anyway, uh, I, ta I, I talked him into uh, getting the 2506. I said, you know, we can load it down. I said, you know, and they did have the dies that the guy brought in with that uh, rifle. So he picked up the dies and he, he got the rifle. I think with some half-heartedness, he wasn't, he wasn't totally sold on the idea. Uh, but I told him, I said, don't worry about it. I said, well, we can load it down and, and uh, it you know, moderate velocities. And of course, I didn't know at the time that it's not a it's not a very versatile cartridge in that respect. It's not like a two twenty two two fifty that you can load up and down any number of uh, you know velocity and uh, have it perform. It's oh, we get the mosquitoes. So, um, but it would have it would have I'm sure it would have been uh, loaded down with uh, enough enough accuracy to uh, do the job, but. Um, we took it. We took it back to my loading room, and uh, the only powder I had, you know, slow-burning powder, was uh, 
4350. So although the book the book I had recommended uh, H4831 or you know IMR 4831, we went with the 4350 figure and that it be it would be you know acceptable. Well, he just wanted to load up the heaviest load there was. And um, full steam ahead. So that's what we did. We picked the heaviest load in the book, loaded it up with some uh, uh, 117 grain bullets, and took it to the range. And I wasn't sure what it was going to do. He, he put a... Uh, he put a Bushnell band of one and a half to five scope on it. The, the crosshairs were, it, they were, um, they were a duplex type uh, reticle, and um, they were a little bit coarse. You know, the, the inside, the inside of the reticle was a little bit coarse, so it wasn't what you call a fine, a fine reticle for extreme long range or anything like that. But being that we live here in New England, uh, it was fine. And he was, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't a big varmint hunter, so uh, that was that was the scope he put on it. And uh, that was a, it was a U scope also, so uh, that's that's what he got. So uh, we took it to the range, and after we after we got it on paper with a couple of shots at 100 yards, um, I mean we started out at 25 yards and did did the thing and got it out to 100. And so he fired the first um, he fired the first three round group, and. Uh, my eyes bulged out when we walked down to the target and took a look at a half-inch group. I said, "This is a rifle. This this thing can shoot." I mean, the very first the very first load out of the book that we tried without without messing around with any uh, incremental loads or anything like that, the thing just shot a half-inch group the very first round. So I went. We went back to the bench, and he said, "You you try it." And so I did the same thing, uh, and. Uh, I think it was probably it was about a little bit larger, like a five eighths inch group or something like that. Well, that's all that gun shot ever. It just shot half inch and five eighths. Maybe on a bad day, it would shoot a seven eighths inch group. It was just a super fantastic shooter, and it didn't wander around. It, you know, you could shoot a eight shot, ten shot group, and you'd still be in the same you'd still be in the same hole. Fabulous shooter. So, and with a twenty four inch barrel, it was a very very, you know, is is topping out at its uh, highest velocities. So he didn't want to mess around with any other load. Um, I think he realized that uh, it was it was a little bit it was too fast when he took his first deer with it because the first deer he shot up with it uh, with one shot. I mean the deer was shot up as if it was hit three times. I mean the, the, both both shoulders were bloodshot, and he was complaining he he had lost he had lost most of his back straps too. You know the uh, the tenderloins and all that. It was it was just not. Um, it, it was just not a, a good rifle for uh, close range shooting. The first deer he took with it was only about, and it was a longer shot for New England. It was it was a 65 it was a 65 yard shot uh, across a meadow, and um, so it, it was it was not a it was not right close, but it was certainly close enough to still be in the 3,000 foot per second uh, range. So. He still loved the rifle because it was so accurate, and he he always stuck with that load. I don't think he ever got another. He never got another deer with that particular rifle, and um, and uh, but he always kept it until his uh, dying day, and he passed it on to his uh, daughter. But um, and she liked shooting it because it was lo low recoil. The um, Rifle came out in 1920, uh, just barely 17 years after uh, the government had introduced the uh, 1903 uh, version of the 3006, the the, the, the uh, 3003 uh, cartridge case. So, the the 3006 cartridge case was still very very new uh, on the scene when uh, Adolf Needner, A. O. Needner, came out with it in 1920. Now, wildcatting is popular today, we think. Uh, in those days, it was wildly popular. It was extremely popular for very good reason, because there were no, you, you, if you wanted to have something different than a 3006 or a 250 Savage or a 300 Savage or something like that, you really, you had to go to a gunsmith that would make something up for you uh, to your liking. You know, you had to dream something up 
And uh, there were a lot of these dreamers out there, machinists that were coming up with different stuff. Charles Newton came out with his uh, his uh, six point five uh, ver his six point five uh, Newton, which actually wasn't six point five Newton. I think it was uh, two fifty six Newton. It was a it was a strange name for a cartridge that didn't have that bore diameter. It it, it didn't make sense. But anyway. Um, it was just before the uh, it was before the uh, Winchester introduced the uh, 270 uh, the 270 cartridge with that size case, and uh, it was before it was before the um, 280 had come out. Uh, I don't know. I think the, uh, the the Germans I think had already been working on a on the uh, uh, seven by uh, which one was it? I lose track of all these numbers, but they had they had the uh, the German version that came out. I think that was probably many years later. But wildcats were very uh, very common in those days, and there were a lot of people who were in the business of uh, trying to work up you know uh, different different things from existing brass, just to change you know as a change of pace, so people would have uh, different things out there. And most of the manufacturers were sticking with uh, the standard fare. Um, and um, the cartridge was uh, the cartridge was largely overlooked uh, when it came out, um, although although there was some interest in it, uh, it, it suffered from a, from a significant problem for the average uh, hand loader. Hand loading wasn't as big a deal back in those days. A lot of wildcatters would also you know make make ammunition up for their for their uh, cartridges that they made you know on a limited basis but if you were a hand loader if you could get if you could get dies and die there were no companies like rcbs that you could just order dies from um you know you had to get a machinist or a gunsmith to make you dies but if you had the dies uh, you just couldn't take a 30 or 6 size case and neck it down and the 270 didn't exist then necking it down from from 30 or 6 meant necking it down four calibers because you had to go through 30 to 7 millimeter to 6.5 down to 25. And when you do that with a cartridge, when you do that sort of sizing down with a uh, with with a brass case, uh, it creates a problem at the junction of the shoulder and the neck, uh, where the where the shoulder where the shoulder and the neck meet at that at that juncture, brass piles up at that at that corner. And it creates it creates a ridge on the inside. A lot of people call it a donut. In other words, if you were to take a if you were to take a ball mic and measure it, you'd find that the thickness of the the, the case neck uh, is is such a thickness, and then all of a sudden it bulges. It gets much much heavier right there. There's a shelf there, and um, you can't you just simply can't stuff a bullet in the case beyond that beyond that donut uh, because uh, you'll collapse the case. The case will just simply you know squish down under the under the pressure of the uh, ram so they have to be reamed out um, you know anybody who's doing serious uh, if you're doing any uh, neck sizing down you can you can neck down 306 down to 270 you can neck down uh, you can neck down 6.5 uh, cases down to down to 25 and things like that but you just can't go more than two cases because you're going to get that you're going to get that build up of brass and they have to be reamed. And even if you can get the bullet in, what you're going to have is uh, you're going to have a, a case which uh, the the bullet is captured by that donut, but the upper the upper part of the the brass uh, neck is sloppy, so it's not going to be seating in there tight with with a tight fit all the way up around. So that's that's the way that goes. So if you if you're wondering about whether you can uh, neck down cases, you you can do it with great facility. If you go down one, and even usually two two calibers, but when you go down beyond two calibers, you you have to you have to have a reamer of that specific diameter and ream that brass out for us. So that became a nuisance. So so it never really took off. It was an aficionado's cartridge. It was a, you know, for those people, for 49 years it remained an aficionado's cartridge. For people who wanted, like my friend, he when he bought his, it was a Wildcat. He bought his in the uh, mid-60s before Remington had introduced it. And I suspect that Remington introduced it for very good reason, because they had become shellacked uh, with the... Uh, 
they didn't they didn't compete well in the six millimeter category. Um, in that race, they flunked out badly when they came up with the 244 Remington uh, against the uh, 243. The 244 had too slow a twist and wouldn't stabilize 100 100 grain bullets, so they changed it to six millimeter Remington. And by then, people were already well settled on the uh, 243 Winchester, which had a smaller action and it it had less recoil. Uh, it, it was already it already lost the battle. So while Remington kind of you know went along in that game with the uh, six millimeter Remington for some time, they they really had lost a lot of their shine. Um, and certainly their their 280 their 280 Remington uh, was not faring that well in competition against the two uh, the 270. The 270 was still by far far and away uh, the most popular long range uh, planes game cartridge. Um, and part of that reason was because you know Remington had come out with a a, a, a stupid load. They came out with the 280 with a. 150 grain bullet that was basically at uh, 30 or 6 velocities and nobody could quite understand what was the point of that uh, it you know at less than 3,000 feet per second and the 270 was you know touting velocities of 3140 and things so Remington was having a, they were having their issues but in the 60s uh, you know in the in, in the 60s they were starting to finally um, come up with stuff that was uh, hitting the gong uh, the seven millimeter Remington Magnum became wildly popular. Um, the uh, introduction of the 22 250, which was again that was another that was another long-standing, very uh, popular uh, Wildcat, and that was one of, that was a Wildcat that could be necked down from 25 uh, from 25 caliber down to uh, two, uh, 22 caliber with no trouble whatsoever. So uh, they finally they finally started playing. Uh, with some cartridges that were were becoming very popular, uh, but they they had lost that middle ground. They didn't have they didn't have a 25 caliber cartridge uh, that that really was doing well because the the uh, 243 had uh, basically taken over the scene. So that that had killed off their uh, 257 Roberts in most part. And the 257 Roberts was very poorly, uh, that was very poorly uh, engineered version of Ned Roberts design uh, with too low a velocity, bullets seated way too deeply, and I talk about that in another video. Um, so where, where they were was in, they were trying to, they were trying to capture a, um, they were trying to capture a market that uh, was, was kind of in the middle there. 6.5 was not a popular caliber in those days. 6.5 was still seen as being a Japanese and a Italian cartridge. It was a, it was a, we're in the post-war, still kind of in the post-World War II era um, in the 60s. Most of your World War II veterans were still very much, uh, you know, with us. And uh, they didn't have much use for cartridges that, that rang to them as being, you know, the enemy's uh, calibers. So. Um, six point and metric was not a metric was certainly not a very popular issue back in uh, back in the sixties. Um, so Remington in sixty nine came up with the uh, twenty five oh six, which was um, A O Needner's uh, cartridge uh, with their with their head stamp on it, with Remington's head stamp on it, and. Uh, at first, it did pretty well. It 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 um, you know people were always looking for a uh, super velocity uh, cartridge. Um, people played with it, and uh, you know they certain people certain people liked it. It remains that way to this day. Uh, it's it's an aficionado. It still remains an aficionado's cartridge. You either find a need for it and you like it, or you simply have no need for it at all. And most people simply don't have any need for a cartridge, which it it has almost identical ballistics as the uh, 270 Winchester, uh, but the, the it costs more usually because it's a little bit more difficult to find. Um, it's it's uh, it's simply not as popular as the 270 because it doesn't have that advantage of being able to use it uh, reasonably well on uh, much larger game like bull elk. 
it's fine on you know cows and things uh, but you know for bull elk and moose and, and caribou and things like that it's light it's it, it's it's a lightweight cartridge 120 grain 117 to 120 grain uh, bullet um, just in 25 caliber is two calibers is two calibers smaller than than 270 so a lot of people most people will simply historically they go to the 270 or the 280 so it's a it's a very it's a very viable cartridge for for the person who's looking for a uh, lightweight uh, I should say a, a lightweight recoil um, a gun with light recoil that will reach out with 270 uh, you know velocities and trajectory uh, and uh, that don't need to have you know that additional power that additional uh, bore diameter and bullet mass for uh, larger for larger game the 270 remains the 270 remains as far as i'm concerned the bottom of the the bottom rung of the cartridges that are you know suitable for for bull elk i, I would certainly have no trouble whatsoever taking a 270 uh, with a properly constructed 150 or 160 grain bullet uh, on a on an elk hunt for for big bull elk no no problem whatsoever but because it it's uh, you know limited in terms of penetration on angled shots you know rear angled shots and things like that uh, it remains at the bottom of the, the bottom of the totem pole for that and everything that can be said in that regard for the the 270 is um, is much more so with the uh, 2506 it's it's a very very light cartridge for a heavy game so it's a very very specialized long range plains game cartridge for for what for muleys and for and for uh, pronghorn antelope um, and i and i'm i won't say that it's a it it's a good uh, varmint cartridge uh, simply because it burns so much powder uh, that there are so many other cartridges out there that, that are specialized long-range varmint cartridges that simply don't need to have that kind of uh, powder room. Uh, and they're much, much easier on the shoulder for uh, long-range shooting, you know, shot after shot. The um, 2506 will quickly burn up a barrel if you sit at the edge of a prairie dog town and start popping off, uh, you know, those little critters. You, you're gonna you're gonna fry a barrel and turn it to toast pretty quickly. So, uh, you know, I mean, except for the person who wants to, you know, shoot long range at, uh, you know, coyotes or something like that. If you're up in Saskatchewan or something and you want to have a, a really long range, uh, good wind bucking cartridge for uh, for coyotes you really couldn't do much better than a 87 grain bullet or even maybe a hundred grain bullet in the 2506 it's fantastic for that sort of thing but that's kind of a that's kind of a small niche for um, for any cartridge it's it's still it's still uh, in all regards uh, it's still a long range plains game cartridge you know muleys and pronghorn that's about it in this country um, so for that reason, its uh, its market is limited. Uh, there are currently a few companies that still manufacture them. Remington's now out of business. Savage uh, overwhelmingly has the the greatest number of uh, rifle selection in uh, 2506. They seem to be really occupying that market. Winchester has a couple of uh, Model 70s, I think, in the two in the 2506. Uh, Weatherby makes. 2506s, but of course, you know, you're paying for the Weatherby name, the big W. It's a, uh, it's, uh, other than that, it's, it's pretty well, it, it's pretty well uh, limited to those com companies. So do I recommend a 2506? Yes. If you're if you're a person who uh, doesn't like it doesn't like the recoil of a 3006, and you find the recoil of a 270 still a little bit on the stout side, and it's it's not it's not your uh, cup of tea. For instance, my wife now she's she's five foot one. Um, now she she has shot uh, a 270. She had a 270 Seiko bolt action hunter. Uh, for a number of years, and she she loved it. She shot she shot superbly with it, and got uh, long range long range antelope 300 yards, and she's a terrific shot with it. 
But as she gets older now, you know, that sort of recoil certainly bothers her. And she certainly wouldn't want to be shooting a 270 anymore. So for a person who's shy on recoil, and uh, all they need to do is shoot pronghorns and muleys, uh, the 2506 makes a lot of sense with a 120, 117 grain bullet. Um, I would I would recommend that you you stay away from even though even though there's a lot of good bullets, uh, very accurate bullets. I'd recommend you stay away from ballistic tips and uh, hollow points. A ballistic tip is basically a, a hollow point with a you know pl polymer tip stuck inside the hollow point. Uh, they are very they are very very uh, destructive on meat. Um, and um, they remain destructive even at extended ranges. You know, hollow points, hollow points just, uh, they're unpredictable when it comes to hitting game. Uh, on, on varmints, they're fantastic, but you know, you don't want to destroy, we got bugs out here, and caterpillars. Um, but you don't want to destroy more meat than you have to. Um, you know, I, I, I hark back to what my, my buddy said. You know, you don't want to you don't want to get a 2506 if you're a woodland hunter. If 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 that's your game, uh, you don't want to do that. If you're a woodland hunter and you want to have a flat shooting long range cartridge, I recommend the 270 because you can you can stoke it down. You can you can. Uh, lower its velocity. It's, it's a very versatile cartridge in that respect. You can get extremely good uh, accuracy out of the 270 with reduced loads, loads that are down in the you know 2700 foot per second range, 2800 foot per second range with 130 grain bullets and you have yourself a very fine woodland cartridge but you can't do that with a 2506. It lights 90, it, it, it very much needs to have 90 percent or greater capacity in order for it to perform. It's just a unique uh, thing about that cartridge. So, yes, I do recommend it for the person who needs to have that specialized round. If if you're looking to if you're lo looking to shoot, you know, m muleys and pronghorns, and that's all you need to to have for a for a rifle. That's an ideal cartridge. It's flat shooting, uh, low recoil, and uh, you, it you doesn't get any better. I mean, the 270 doesn't get any better than that because it. It's the same thing, except it just kills them with a bigger diameter bullet. So yes, it's a great cartridge for that. But I, I do want to, I do want to, you know, caution people that when you when you buy a 2506, uh, you're also buying a, a a rifle which, uh, as a used rifle, tends to sit on the shelf for a long time. Uh, in speaking with people I know that are in the business. People who are buying a 2506 like to buy their they like to buy a new one in the box because they suspect that the bore, the bore could be a little bit chewed out from uh, barrel erosion and they they have good reason to suspect that because if you fire too many shots with a 2506 as uh, as overbore as it is it's very easy to burn that barrel up very quickly without too much trouble so a lot of people are shy from them in the used market. So remember when you buy one that uh, you you want to you want to have a gun that you hang on to for a long time. Um, and another problem is too that uh, the same dealers will tell you that it, it tends to be a gun that they find re returns to them very quickly. Uh, people will buy it and then they have the same experience that my buddy did. And I'm talking about in the New England area. You know they they buy it and have the same experience my buddy did with excessive meat. Uh, destruction, so they return it. So those guns wouldn't have a bad barrel at all, but nobody knows that. They don't know. You can't, you know, you can't bring a $400 bore scope with you when you're looking at a rifle unless you happen to have one, um, and you can't see what the what the bore is like. So that's the way that that's the way that goes. So on this fine day, I finally got a I finally got a chance to talk about the 2506 and give you a little bit of history about it. Um, I think it's a I think it's a fun round to shoot, especially when I see those those tiny little groups come up. And I've heard that that's that that's something that I hear from a lot of people who have 2506s that they that they're superb shooters. They seem to shoot with uh, with with very much the same sort of um, um, accuracy as a 257 Roberts. I'd give the edge to the 257 when it comes to superb accuracy. I mean, it's a just a little bit. It's a little bit more accurate if you're really looking for that finite accuracy because the the, the bore is 
more balanced. You know, it's uh, the cartridge. The cartridge is based on the seven by fifty-seven uh, Mauser. So the uh, two fifty-seven has a, a slight edge when it comes to that superb accuracy. But when it comes to usable superb accuracy, the twenty-five oh six is certainly. If you're not looking to, if you're not looking to win, you know, competitions or something. Uh, you know, you can certainly you can certainly have a lot of fun with the 2506. So here, Benny, he was out there running around his lawn and having a good time. So what do you say, Benny? Well, thank everybody uh, who's been uh, subscribing and and uh, giving me those thumbs up, and um, be sure to ring that bell. Subscribe and ring that bell, and uh, if you want to have more. You know, if you want to have more shooting fun, uh, you know, we'll certainly, uh, I appreciate the uh, Patreon donors who have been uh, helping me out in that regard. Um, it gives me some ammo to shoot so I can uh, take you to the range. And uh, and I also, I, I purchased, with that I was able to purchase that uh, Mini 14 stock, uh, the wood stock that uh, I showed you. So that's the way that goes. So we say, Benny, Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell, and God bless.